This morning we're concluding our sermon series on the book of Jonah as we look at the last eight verses of Jonah. Jonah 4, verses 4 through 11. Hear the word of our Lord for us today. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at, the, at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of Jesus Christ, give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Christ, so that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened. Help us to know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints, and the immeasurable greatness of your power at work in us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In this book of Jonah, over the last eight or nine weeks now, we have seen God send a a storm, a giant fish, and now a little worm, but no punishments. As Jonah complained last week, God is compassionate, God is slow to anger, and Jonah was afraid that God would relent from the punishment he had promised on Nineveh, and he would not destroy Jonah's enemies, And now Jonah is mad because that's what God did. God has let Jonah down. Jonah came wanting destruction, and all he has seen toward these awful Ninevites is mercy. Of course, what we can see, and Jonah can't apparently see, is that he is as in need of the mercy of God as everyone else in Nineveh. He's as deserving of God's judgment as the people of Nineveh are. And yet he's receiving mercy. Let's look at just a few moments, for just a few moments, at what God's mercy looks like as he reaches out again to Jonah as the book ends. The first thing we notice about God and his mercy is that God is patient with Jonah. This is Jonah, remember, the runaway prophet who's now upset with God for not destroying Nineveh. But he's still hopeful. He's so hopeful that God may yet send destruction on Nineveh that he doesn't leave in a fit. He sets up camp outside the town to wait every day and stare at it, hoping to see fire come down. That's what he's hoping for as he sits and he waits. He is so convinced that maybe God will still give them punishment. He's hopeful that God will kill 120,000 people. This is the same Jonah who on the boat when the storm was coming that he knew his sin had caused that could kill him and all of the sailors first thought about himself and not about the sailors. He was fine dying as long as he didn't have to go to Nineveh. Everyone else prays and Jonah sits in the bottom of the boat and sleeps because he doesn't care about anyone else but himself. This is the same Jonah who in the bottom of the ocean in a fish has a conversion experience and now just a few days later he is right back to hating his enemies that God has called him to go preach the gospel to, to call them back to God. He is still stuck 
wishing ill on those who are not like him, stuck in his nationalist pride, stuck in his self-righteousness, thinking that he is better than everybody else. And yet, God hasn't given up on Jonah. Here God is again coming to Jonah to gently talk to him, to try to woo him back, to get him to see things another way, to change direction again. I'll be honest, I find this return to sin by Jonah to be oddly comforting. There's something comforting about the fact that Jonah could see the strength of God in the storm and be stuck in the fish and then finally say, okay, God, I'll submit to you. And a few days later, decide, no, God, I don't like to. I'm mad at you again. That's comforting because I've been there. Have you ever been there where you think, I've made progress in my life with God and then you realize, oh, no, wait, I have the exact same sin I used to struggle with. It's still right there. Have you ever had that experience? Because there's a reality that following God isn't easy. Sometimes we sing songs in church, like somehow that when we meet God, everything will be better in our lives. And we talk about it's easy, like we we come to the garden and it's always wonderful when we're spending time with God. Is it always easy to spend time with God or sometimes is it just hard work? Sometimes it's hard work, isn't it? Sometimes we read the Bible and you're like, man, God's just coming alive and you can hear him speak. And other times like, that's weird. I don't know what to do with that. Or I don't even want to read right now, but you still try, right? Because we want to follow, but it's hard sometimes. We still struggle with ongoing sins we've always struggled with when we think we've repented of it and we're finally set free. It will crop up in new ways in us or we'll find a new sin we didn't know we had before because following God isn't easy. This is how Paul describes it in Romans 7. He says this, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. I want to do good, but evil is right there with me. Following God is hard. Jesus says that wide is the road that leads to destruction, narrow the one that leads to life, because it's hard. Not many find it. So we should not be surprised in our life when the sins that we committed in the past keep popping up and we trip over them again because following God is hard. But God is patient. Even as Jonah struggles with the same sin that led him to the bottom of the ocean in the belly of the fish, God comes seeking him out, reaching out to Jonah, patiently trying to bring him back to restore this lost and broken and messed up and confused prophet because God is patient with his kids and God is patient with you and patient with me. God's patient. Even when we struggle with sin and we should have moved on and we haven't yet, God is patient. God is patient and God weeps with us. God comes to Jonah and he asks Jonah if he has a right to be angry. This is the kind of question that counselors ask us. If you've ever been in counseling, they ask you to test your feelings. They'll say, are you right to be angry about that? And at that moment, you realize, maybe not about that, but I'm mad at you right now. Don't meddle in my life, counselor. Right? Because that's the hard question. They make you examine your life again, and you have to start thinking through, well, am I mad because what they did is wrong, or because it messed up with my assumptions of how life ought to work out for me, or because I was presuming on them, and I, maybe I'm in the wrong, and there's all sorts of questions you have to go into. It's a question to self-reflect. Jonah's not very good at self-reflection. He doesn't seem to do much. He thinks he's right. He'd rather just be angry and die. 
But God asks, Jonah, are you right to feel angry that I didn't kill 120,000 people? Are you right to be angry that this weed that grew up overnight died and gave you a little bit of shade? Are you angry about the right things in the world or the wrong things? And then God gives Jonah that time to think. And here we need a little bit of Hebrew. God comes back after the plant dies, and he says that he's, is is it wrong for God to be concerned about Nineveh? And in that word concerned, the NIV flattens out some of God's emotion there. So the Hebrew word is the word ahus. I had to look that up, and I had my computer tell me how to pronounce it. It's the word ahus. I can't spell it for you. I can just say it out loud. It's the word ahus. Um, And God says he he has ahus for the city of Nineveh. So I thought, what does the word ahus mean? And what it means is that he carries the suffering of others, that he's feeling with them what they are feeling, that he has pity or compassion for their pain, that he weeps with them, that God weeps with them in their suffering. This is an amazingly shocking thing for God to say about himself because in the ancient world, they believed that the gods could love people with benevolent love, but not with the love of attachment. Benevolent love is when you do something for someone that you don't really like just because you're so wonderful and gracious. And so gods could have benevolent love. They could do nice things to people, but the gods didn't care about people because we are too small for the gods to care about. Just like if you have a spider in your house and you carry it outside rather than stomp on it, you're showing benevolent love for the spider. You do not have emotional attachment to the spider. If you do, we should reevaluate your whole value system because you should stomp on it. But anyway, if... <laughs> I hate spiders. If they're in my house, they are trespassers. They need judgment. But maybe you're more gracious than me and you save it out of benevolence for the spider. It does not have a relationship with you. You're not going to invite it for a potluck. Like, there's no relation. It's just a spider. You're benevolently loving it. That's how the gods treat us, according to the ancient world. That when they do kind things, it's out of their benevolence. It's not because they actually like us or even think about us in any significant way. They just randomly did something nice. But notice what God says. God says that he is emotionally attached to us. That he weeps with us, that he suffers with us, that there's an emotional bond, that our hearts are bound together with God's somehow. Now we get this because this happens to us all of the time, right? It happened when you were first born. You did not choose to be bound to your parents, but you were born and they took care of you and you realized when you were older that you loved them, even if when you were a teenager you forgot. You remembered when you got older that you love your parents because they cared for you and you're, you're bound to them. And then when you get older, you might meet someone and then you might fall in love. It, that, that word fall is interesting, right? Because it implies something. It just happened to us. I didn't jump into love. I fell over into love. It just happened. I didn't totally choose it. It just occurred. Suddenly my heart was bound to this other person and now I care about them and I have a love of attachment for them. We don't choose it. It just happens. And sometimes we get these attachments over silly things. Like I have a stuffed animal in my house. I'm letting you in on a secret. You cannot tease me about this, okay? But I have a stuffed animal in my house that my grandmother gave me when I had surgery when I was in third grade. And it was like two months after after her husband, my grandpa, had died. And I've always loved George. He's a stupid stuffed animal. He's a gorilla. He is not Curious George. Curious George is a monkey, to be absolutely clear. He's a gorilla. Just want to be clear. I love George. I don't actually love him like I love people. But I'm emotionally attached to George. If you're mean to George, I'll be not liking you anymore. Even though I'm an adult and I know it's stupid, I've emotionally got attached to George when I was a kid, right? Jonah has this with the plant, right? The plant comes up, he gets shade. He cares about this plant. He's attached to the plant that the worm eats and dies. So he's mad that the plant died because he became bound to this plant. We don't always choose what we're bound to, do we? What our heart gets attached to, but he's attached to the plant and he cares about the plant. But here's the thing about God. We get bound to things that meet needs for us, that that satisfy some longing in us, 
God doesn't have any needs. God is not longing for a relationship with people. God's relationship needs are fully satisfied in the Trinity. God is not longing for you to do something for Him because whatever you do, He could have done quicker and better and more magnificently than you're going to do it. No matter how impressive your achievements are, they don't measure up to what God could do before He had His first cup of coffee in the morning. Nothing you do can impress God because everything you do is minuscule compared to what God could do without giving it a second thought. There is no need God has to be in a relationship with you. There is no need that you satisfy in God that would bind God to you. God chooses to have his heart tied up with yours simply because God chooses. God chooses to love and be attached to us simply because he does. And so when we suffer... And when we struggle, God weeps with us. God weeps for the people of Nineveh who are lost because God chose to love them too. And God weeps for you in your, in your hurts and in your struggles because God chose to love you. And God weeps for the people in your life, whether it's your children or your neighbors or a coworker who do not know Him, because God chose to love those people too. And God weeps for those who are lost because He loves them. God is patient. God weeps over the suffering of those He loves. And God's generous. I want you to know at the very end of the book of Jonah, God describes the Ninevites this way. He says, they are people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. I am literally one of those people I practiced for like 10 minutes this morning, right and left, because I'm bad at it. But they don't know their right hand from their left. What he's saying is, these people are so foolish, they are so unaware of the world that they don't even know their right from their left. They can't tell that what they're doing is wrong. They don't understand basic morality. They are completely blind and clueless to how to live in their world, and they don't know their danger. That's how God sees the Ninevites. God gives them the benefit of the doubt that they don't mean to be so bad, they just don't know any better. They're that foolish. Lots of people living in our world don't have a clue about the meaning of life or how to make wise choices in their lives or um, how to tell right from wrong. But God doesn't look down on these people as if they're idiots and fools. He has compassion and says they don't know. They're blind. They need someone to tell them and show them the way. Now, when I look at people who have messed up their lives by their own bad choices, I do my best not to, but often I find myself thinking that it probably serves them right. They made all those bad choices, and someone probably warned them, and they didn't listen, and so they probably had all this suffering coming. It's their own dumb fault. In my bad moments, that's what I think. Maybe you can feel that way sometimes, too. Or when someone does something really embarrassing, and it goes viral on social media, do you ever watch it and laugh? Sometimes I watch them and laugh, and then I realize, oh wait, that's an actual person. I wonder how they're going through school right now when everyone's laughing at them and what kind of pain that caused for them. Or when we see a rival defeated in a sporting event, like yesterday if you were cheering for your team and, the other, and, and you beat the, your, your opponent, or when an election and the, and the other side loses, do you ever gloat because it feels so good that your team won? All of those things we do, blaming people for their problems, laughing at people in their suffering, gloating when our side wins, are ways that we distance ourselves from the humanity and the pain and the suffering of other people. It's ways that we try to not have to suffer with others, that we try to not make their difficulties have to be our own. It's a defense mechanism to keep ourselves from having to feel what they feel. We get to blame them for their own suffering instead. But God isn't like that. God chooses to suffer with them and he's generous toward them that when we mess up, he goes, they don't know any better. They're stupid. They can't help it. He gives us the benefit of the doubt. And in that regard, the contrast between God and Jonah probably couldn't be any greater because he has no doubt that Nineveh deserves all the punishment that God could dish out on them. But if you have some familiarity with the life of Jesus, 
you can't help but think about how Jesus embodies fully this compassion of God. When Jesus came riding to Jerusalem, he wept over the city because they were so blinded by their religious traditions, their religiosity, that they couldn't recognize the Son of God when the Son of God was standing right there with them. He longed to see Jerusalem actually come back to God, to leave their, their religion and come into relationship with God, to gather and protect the city from the coming judgment, and he knew that they wouldn't listen, and he weeps over their future suffering. And then on the cross, surrounded by crowds who cried out for his murder, Jesus says this, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, or they don't know their right hand from their left. They're blind. They know they're killing a man. They don't know they're killing the Son of God. They can't see it. So God's, Jesus says, forgive them. Notice, Jesus doesn't say they aren't doing anything wrong, because then they wouldn't need forgiveness. They're doing something wrong. They're sinning. They need forgiveness. But Jesus asked God to forgive them because they don't know any better. They don't realize that what they're doing is wrong, so Jesus says, have mercy on them. Jesus is the prophet that Jonah was supposed to be, that Jonah should have been. He responds as Jonah should have responded to the people of Nineveh. Of course, ultimately, Jesus is willing to lay down his life in pursuit of the mission of God because he loves us enough to do that. He saw us in our hopeless position, and he was willing to do whatever it took to rescue you and me. Jesus, in that regard, reveals a complicated truth about God, that God is both compassionate and just. This is what, what Jonah couldn't figure out because he, he is afraid, he tells us at the beginning of chapter 4, that God would be compassionate and slow to anger. He's afraid that God is going to be merciful to the Ninevites and he wants God to be just and he can't figure out how God can be both of those at the same time. In his complaint to God that he, was be, he would be merciful, he actually quotes a story from the life of Moses. One day Moses comes to God and says, God, I want to see you face to face. And God says, you can't do that. Because I am so holy and you are so sinful that if you're in my presence, you will die if you see me face to face. Like the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. That'll be it. You'll just melt in front of God. And he says, so you can't see my, my, my front side, but you can see my back side. So I'll put you in a cliff, I'll walk by, and you can see my back side. And as God walks by, by Moses, this is what God says in Exodus 34. He says, the Lord, the Lord... The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's what, that's what Jonah's afraid of, that he'll get that God. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. Jonah can't see how the mercy of God and the justice of God could ever fit together, how they could ever work together in any meaningful way. He wants all of one or the other, and he's afraid he's going to get the mercy, and that's what he got, and he wanted justice. The reality is, if you're going to be a good, loving God, you cannot just forgive people. Because if you forgive everything... What you're saying is that when people do awful things to others, there are no consequences for them. Which is easy to say maybe when you're in the United States and we have not lived through war and we don't live in communities ravaged by gang violence. But imagine if you've lived in Syria and the government has tortured your loved ones for years. Or you live in Afghanistan and your village was bombed. And you saw the body parts of your loved ones in the streets. Or you live in Central America and the gangs are, are forcibly recruiting your children in and your children are dying because of it. And you call out to God for justice. And if God only offered mercy, that would not be a good God to not deal with the sin that's happened. Jonah's right that he needs God to be just. We need God to be just. What Jonah couldn't see, though, is that God's plan for justice was not simply to punish everyone who does wrong because then we'll all get punished. It was to willingly take on the punishment that we have all earned on himself. 
And so Jesus comes and he takes the punishment that the people in Syria who are doing the torturing deserve on himself if they repent and turn to him. And he takes the punishment that those who have bombed cities and blew up, blew up people in Afghanistan deserve on himself if they will repent and come to him. He takes the punishment on himself because sin has to be dealt with in some way. We can't simply forgive and pretend it didn't happen. It's not just or good. And so God does punish, but God's punishment comes in the form of an offer. I'll take the punishment from you if you'll come follow me. And then Jesus offers mercy to those who do. The book of Jonah ends with a final explanation from God for why he had mercy on Nineveh. But the mere fact that God comes back again to talk with Jonah, to try one more time to create some sort of compassion in Jonah, to, to prick at the humanity of Jonah, to get Jonah's heart alive again rather than his heart of stone, to look beyond himself to see the 120,000 people of Nineveh. The fact that God comes back one more time again proves that God never gives up on Jonah. God doesn't give up on us even when we struggle to follow, when we struggle to repent, when we struggle to have mercy and compassion on others. God keeps giving Jonah opportunity after opportunity. And then the book ends. And if you're like me, you have lots of questions. Like, what did Jonah do next? Did he get God's point and did he go tell the Ninevites, I'm so glad you're alive? Did he go back to Israel as a changed prophet who's seen the mercy of God and now he preaches a different message from God and he's not just the nationalist prophet or he says the king is right, but actually preaches God's word? Did he change that way? Or did he curl up under that dead tree and join it? because he'd rather be dead than live in a world where God has mercy on his enemies. What does Jonah do? I don't know what Jonah does. But of course, the point of the book of Jonah is not for us to know what Jonah does. It's for us to ask ourselves what we will do. The real question is, how do you respond to the story of Jonah? Like Jonah, we are all prophets too meaning that we've been given a word from God to share with the world that there is a Savior who longs to reconcile them back to God and that there is a better way to live than how our world teaches us to live. We've been given that message. We are prophets sent with that word. It may be your neighbor across the street you've been sent to. Maybe someone down the hall in a cubicle in your, in your company. It might be someone who works on the same line as you on the floor it may be someone who lives in your apartment complex or works at your, the assisted living center where you are. They may sit next to you in class. They may sit at your dinner table every night or when the family gets together at holidays. I don't know who it is, but I guarantee this. There is someone in your life that God has called you to be a prophet to. Because Jesus said to go and make disciples of all nations. That's the mission he's given, not the church institution, but to the people of the church, each of us. You've been sent. You've been sent as a prophet just as much as Jonah was. Part of following Jesus means that we go and make disciples and we have to go tell people. I'll be honest, when I think about that, I want to find a cop-out. So what I want to do is I want to say, like the somewhat misquoted on St. Francis of Assisi, I will preach the gospel every day and use words only when I must. We've lived that really well, haven't we? Preach it every day with my actions and use words only if I have to. Maybe never. Please don't make me use words. Right? So I'll preach the gospel being kind to my neighbors, by, by only speaking well of other people, by being generous toward people. I'll, do, I'll serve in the school. I'll be a really good person. And then people should go, oh, you're so good. You must be a Christian. But I won't tell them. They have to guess. Right? But notice, when Jonah is called to Nineveh, God doesn't say, Jonah, go to Nineveh and model how to be a just person so they ask you about it. Because that was the goal, right? Get them to stop killing people. God doesn't say, Jonah, go model how to do that. God says, Jonah, go tell them to stop doing what they're doing. Use your words. 
The command is not to model things well. The command is to use your words and tell people. You don't make disciples by being a really good one and hoping people imitate you. You make disciples by telling them who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it, inviting them to learn how to follow too. It takes words. It takes words to tell people that there is a God who loves them and longs for them to come back to Him. It takes words to tell people that there is a God who wants to bless them and has plans for their life. That there is a God who has made Himself known to them in the Jesus revealed in Scripture. You can't do that with actions alone. You have to open your mouth. And so as the book of Jonah ends, our question is a simple one. How have you responded to that call? Are you like Jonah looking for the first boat to Tarshish to avoid having to say anything? Are you sitting under the tree complaining that God has mercy on people who have annoyed you and are sinful? Or have you embraced this call not as a one-time event or something that you pay church staff people to do, but as a lifestyle of living as a vocal witness that there is an empty tomb and there is a Savior who calls the world back to Him? Who are you in the story? Are you Jonah? Or are you following the more perfect Jonah, Jesus? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we confess today that too often we are like Jonah. We are looking for excuses. We are avoiding the work you've given us to do. We are trying to explain it away. But we confess today that you have called us to speak, that you have called us to go and tell others about your Son, that there is a God who loves them. Father, give us the courage to do so. Give us eyes to see people in our lives who don't know you. And if we really know no one who doesn't know you, Father, convict us of that sin as well, that you have called us to go and make disciples and we have chosen to hide among believers instead. And help us to see new ways in which we can make connections and relationships with those who don't know you so that in us they can not only experience your love through us, but they might hear of your love in our words as well. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.